I would have never admitted to anybody before I came here that I was socially impaired. I knew all along that I was not in contact with my friends or family, that I was separated like with a glass barrier. But I know now that I'm mentally ill. Just like someone with cancer that has to take chemotherapy, I know I have to do certain interventions to prevent another psychosis. And I know I've learned those things here and that I can do them. Just like someone who takes medication for a heart problem. If they don't take that medication, they may die. If I don't take the steps to keep myself from going insane again, someone else could die. It's just, uh, I think in the past I always avoided having relationships with people because I didn't want to have the hurt. Right. And now exactly. I've made, you know, a lot of friends here and it does hurt leaving them behind. I can't believe it. Yeah. Well, two years ago. I mean, who you knows, you know, it seemed memory. like a long, a long road of hope, you know, a couple <laughs> years ago. Here you are. It seemed like a mountain of work ahead and I thought I was finished. You helped me get there, buddy. Yeah. I miss you Unrelenting, unforgettable, America undercover. This spot's one of the most chilling interviews you'll ever see. It really surprised me when it took his head off. The Iceman, a cold, ruthless killer. If you mess with me, I'll hurt you. The Iceman, a mob killer tracked by police for years, who confessed to the brutal deaths of over a hundred victims, but... Mr. Kukleski, we're going to conduct a test on you. Back search here. Put your arms out. On May 25, 1988, Richard Kuklinski was convicted of multiple murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. This ended 30 years of cold-blooded killing by a master criminal police called the Iceman. 
Richard Kuklinski is one of the most dangerous criminals we have ever come across in this state. He murdered by guns. He murdered by strangulation. He murdered by putting poison on victims' food. He did all of this at the same time while exhibiting a normal, placid family existence. His wife, his children uh, were uninvolved in his criminal activities. Yet, uh, we are faced with uh, evidence, convicting evidence of uh, numerous grisly murders. How many people have you killed? I'm an approximate guess. Approximate will go with more than a hundred. How do you feel about killing? I don't. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't have a feeling one way or the other. I think if I had a choice, I wouldn't. The following program is based on 17 hours of an interview conducted under maximum security at Trenton State Prison. Law enforcement officials allowed our cameras unprecedented access in an attempt to uncover details of various unsolved crimes. It was also hoped that the interview would help to penetrate the mind of Richard Kuklinski, a mind made for murder. Richard, when you were on the streets, what kind of weapons did you use? When I was out on the street to do something, I carried three guns and a knife. I had a derringer in each pocket. And a gun on my ankle, a bigger per gun just in case. And a knife. And it all depends how it came about. You did it yesterday that he used a shotgun to go to the stoplight or something like that. Or... I had a red light. We were following this fellow. We pulled up at a, at a red light, came alongside of him, <clears throat> and shot the shotgun and took his head off. He never saw the green light. It was a sort of shotgun. It was very, uh, as a matter of fact, when it happened, it surprised me. I expected the, uh, the man to uh, die, but I, it really surprised me when it, it, when it took his head off. It was uh, something I didn't expect. Richard Kuklinski is not a serial killer. He's not a drug-crazed uh, wild man running around with a machine gun. He's not a person that is driven by perverse uh, sexual desires. He doesn't drink. He doesn't gamble. Uh, all of these things, um, which many persons that are involved in killing and murders uh, often are motivated by. Richard Kuklinski, instead, uh, is nothing more than a predator uh, on human beings. Uh, his motivation is greed, and his method of murder is very varied. Uh, and very extreme. Richard, I understand that you're an expert in the use of cyanide. How many times did you kill with it? Quite a few. What's different ways you use cyanide? You could uh, put it in liquid form. You could, uh, there could, person could say, for instance, a person could be in a bar you bunk into them, possibly uh, by mistake, or say you were intoxicated, spill the drink on them, and leave. 
everybody just looks around, thinks you're drunk or that you just had an accident or something. And uh, meanwhile, it's soaking through their clothes into their pores and into their system. And eventually, they'll die. I've been in a restaurant where we were eating and the guy went to the bathroom. And uh, uh, when I was in the bathroom, we put a little boost in his, uh, in his food. And um, he was rushed to the hospital after that. And uh, he died. And they buried him. I'm not exactly sure what they put on, what they attributed his death to. But, you know, it wasn't homicide. Somewhere, and I don't know where, he picked up on cyanide poisoning as being a good way, a good, quick way to kill somebody. It's such a good way to kill somebody that that's the gas that's used in gas chambers. I mean, it, cyanide in a gas form, which is similar to cyanide in a, in a, in a being eaten form, kills very quickly. It's a very, it kills faster than arsenic, faster than strychnine, and it's hard to detect um, if the person, if it isn't specifically looked for. He murdered, sometimes months apart, years apart. He used different methods. Um, he would go so far as to uh, plan in his crimes uh, the actual deceit of law enforcement. Uh, by that I mean he would on occasion uh, murder someone, uh, cut their body, wrap them in layer after layer of plastic bags and material, and then deposit the body many, many miles from the murder scene. What is it to dispose of something? You throw it away. You throw it anywhere. It all depends if you don't want it found or if you want it found. If you want it found, it doesn't matter. You just leave it there. If you don't want it found, you could take it somewhere. You could bury it. You could uh, put it in a big drum. You put it in the trunk of a car and have it crushed. You leave it in town, you put it on a park bench. I mean, you know, you can put it anywhere you want. They found a few people sitting on park benches, I'm sure. As a matter of fact, I know they have. Are there any murders that you committed that, you, that haunt you, that you just sort of, you feel and you do? Nothing haunts me. No murders haunt me. Nothing. I don't think about it. That's why it's hard for me to tell you. In order for me to be able to tell you when something happened, I'd have to think about why, when. If I think about it, it would wind up hurting me. So I doubt, I don't think about it. If I had a choice, and of course, you as already said to me, we all have choices. <laughs> Maybe we do. At the time, I didn't seem to have one. But if I could have, I would like to be different than what I am. I would have liked to have been different than what I was, yes. It would be better. It would have been better for me. I would have liked to have had a better outlook on life. But I can't change yesterday. Richard Kuklinski was born April 11, 1935, in a low-income public housing project in Jersey City. His father was a brakeman for the railroad, and his mother worked in a meatpacking plant. I didn't like my father, as he would beat me just because uh, he felt like it. 
to get my attention, I guess. He would think nothing of coming in and smacking you. You know, basically. He'd just come in and give you a whooping for no reason whatsoever. And my mother was cancer. She would destroy everybody. She thought I took too long to do something. She didn't hesitate to give me a swat here and there. And she didn't just use her hand. She, she would hit me with a, a broomstick or something like that. It wouldn't, it hurts. As a matter of fact, she broke the broom on me more than once. Richard's mother believed that harsh discipline at home should go hand in hand with a rigid religious education. I was raised uh, Catholic. Uh, we were very, she was strict as far as the religion goes. I went to... Uh, Your mother. My mother, yeah. My mother, uh, we went to uh, Catholic grammar school. And we were raised with the Catholic belief. I was even an altar boy. But uh, during the course of my life, I don't really believe it. It's just the way it happened. Didn't mean it to happen that way, but it just happened that way. When his father abandoned the family, Richard, a skinny, timid young teenager, was left to fend for himself. He was an easy target for street gangs, but by the time he was 16, things began to change. When I was a young man, I found out that if you hurt somebody, they'll leave you alone. Good guys do finish last. When I tried to leave everybody alone, just do my own thing, everybody just wanted to hurt me. Until one day, I just decided, well, I've had enough of this picking. And I went upstairs and I took a uh, a bar, which the clothes used to hang on in the uh, closet. And I went back downstairs and there were like six young men still figuring they were gonna mess with my head and uh, we went to war. To their surprise, I was no longer taking the beating. I was giving it. And that's when I learned that it was better to give than to receive. I've been known to hurt people for no reason. If you check out my background as I came up, I could be anywhere and if somebody humiliated me, I would think nothing of hitting them with a cue stick in an instant. And the only thing they might have done was made me feel bad or challenge my authority at the time. Kuklinski's reputation as a tough guy with a hair-trigger temper grew. By the time he was 18, the abused had become the abuser. It wasn't long before he committed his first murder. I got into a fight in a bar. We got into an argument to fight, and I hit him with a with a cue stick. Uh, a few too many times, and he died. How'd you feel after uh, when you found out he died? I had felt very bad, very very bad. I was upset. I didn't mean to do it, actually. But surprisingly, I felt sadness, and after a while, I felt something else. I didn't feel sad. I was sad along with some sort of a rush that I had control, and if you mess with me, I guess it's, if you mess with me, I, I'll hurt you. By the time he'd reached his 20s, Kuklinski had become a petty crook and pool hustler. 
Then his life changed. In 1960, he met a pretty 19-year-old girl named Barbara Pedrin. He was absolutely flowers at the door every day and, and uh, considerate and romantic and all of the things that anybody could, could hope for, dream for. He bought me beautiful things. We went fun places. He, he was happiest when we were together. He was happiest when just he and I were together. He and Barbara had three children. But with just an eighth grade education, he could only get low paying jobs that didn't pay enough to support his growing family. I didn't have the capability of getting a better paying job. Was I gonna push a yarn truck the rest of my life? Make menial amount of money? I couldn't have afforded one child, let alone three. He went to work at a film lab, where he began to pirate pornographic films and sell them to outside sources connected to the Gambino crime family. This connection led to other criminal activities, and it wasn't long before he went from being a small-time hood to a big-time killer. He worked as a hitman and associated with a gang that worked out of the notorious Gemini Lounge in Brooklyn. Above the lounge was a mafia killing factory where victims were killed and dismembered. Hacked bodies were packaged in plastic bags and carted away. Kuklinski was the perfect enforcer. He was brutal and he knew how to intimidate. If people owed money, they either paid up or paid with their lives. Most people paid their bills. Some didn't. I remember one guy, he was um, owed a lot of money. Well, I guess a considerable amount of money. Uh, he hid behind, he thought he could hide behind a door. It was a nice door, expensive door. Anyway, uh, most people don't realize that uh, when you come to answer a door, uh, if there's light in the background, the person on the outside can look through the peephole and see the guy coming to the door. So he came to the door, asked who it was, and uh, he looked through the peephole. He never saw what hit him. For Richard Kuklinski, murder had become a way of life, and the macabre became the commonplace. Would you ever use a chainsaw? I mean, to cut someone up? Yes. I've done that. To dismember them, yes. Not to kill them, no. What was it like to cut somebody up with a, with a, uh, you know, when the other guy was dead? How did it feel to cut some guy up with a, with a chainsaw? Well, I didn't have any feeling one way or the other. That, that just happened. That's the way it had to be. Messy? Yes. Yes, it was. Did it make you sick? No. I've had a request where the guy wanted the guy's tongue cut out. And he also wanted his tongue put in his uh, rear end. So I believe there was a definite point he wanted to get across. I have an experience that I don't know if I should tell you or not that it might, it probably would offend a lot of people. Uh, I don't know, I don't think I should, I'll go into that. Go ahead. Yeah, it's not a good one. No, go ahead, tell them. It 
There was a man who was begging and pleading and, uh, and, and praying, I guess. And, um, He was pleased God and all over the place. So I told him he could have a half hour to pray to God. And if God could come down and change the circumstances, he'd have that time. But God never showed up. And he never changed the circumstances. And that was that. It wasn't too nice. That's one thing I shouldn't have done, that one. I shouldn't have done it that way. By the 1970s, between his illegal activities and contract killings, he was becoming a wealthy man. He now lived in an expensive home in a middle-class neighborhood with his wife and three children. Richard, what did you charge for a, for a hit? If I hit somebody, I wouldn't hit it for peanuts. I'd like to have some, some money. I say if I were to do somebody, I want at least five.